Hey, it's Jason here at Pedals from the Past. It's winter time, so we're into the December, January, February months. This is prime fruit tree planting time. Today we're going to talk about planting pome fruits. So that would be apple, be pear. We throw persimmon into that because we're going to plant them very similarly. In the winter time, of course, there's no leaves. So how do you go to the nursery and pick out a good tree? Um, we start with looking at labeling. I love to see a plant have a tag. We need to know what the name of that plant is. This is an Asian pear, the variety is Shinko, and it's grafted onto Caloriana rootstock. That tells us so much. We know what kind of pear to anticipate, what the fruit's gonna look like, but we also know what it's grafted onto. That Caloriana rootstock's gonna be a good strong rootstock and produce a very large tree. But when we go down to the nursery, there here they are with bare stems, no leaves. I start looking at branching after that. I'm looking for branches that are flexible. I don't want to see any broken or dead growth. And then look at this guy. I love this one because we typically like for our fruit trees to be branching somewhere about, you know, 18, 24 inches from the graft. This stuff right here, I will remove because those are just little sprouts from the rootstock. Nothing to worry about. Clip them away and let it put energy where we want it. But look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven branches that we can choose from. We really only need three or four at the most on this pair. Preferably one coming out this direction, one going this direction, one coming this way, and then look at this one coming this way. Then, as we go up the tree a little bit further, once we get about three feet above the highest branch, we'll clip it a second time and develop another whirl of branches. That's true for pears and apples especially. So when we're looking for that tree, look for the label. Make sure you know what you're getting. Look at those stems. Make sure they're flexible. And then uh, no broken branches. And look for some good branching. Now, this is the one I'm going to get. And now we're going to go plant it. Talking about location, we're talking about our pome fruits, right? We're going to find the perfect place to plant our pear or our apple or our persimmon tree. All three of them like a full sun location. So we want to have as much sun exposure as we possibly can. Dad and I picked this location because it's got a little bit of elevation. You can see behind me the pond is lower, of course, than we are here. And going toward Grace in this direction, it's a little bit lower, so we're not gonna have water uh, ponding right here. And that's a big, big issue with fruit trees. We want good drainage. We know we have heavy clay soil, we can improve it, but we don't want for it to be the lowest spot in the landscape where water drains the last. So we like this location. We have planted these Asian pear trees. You can see the size of these trunks and these guys, you're looking at a tree that's now 14 years old. And we, of course, at our nursery, we love to approach gardening from an educational standpoint. So dad and I planted Hosui and Korean Giant and Shinko, three great varieties for central Alabama, and they cross pollinate one with the other. So when selecting a tree, make sure about to know about the pollination needs. And with these guys, this offers us a strong trunk, four to six scaffold limbs that are side branching. And all of these little spurs that you see here are going to be loaded down with flowers and ultimately fruit. And we've tried to make it where it can be low enough that some of it we can reach from the ground. And then, of course, some of it we, we can reach uh, from uh, height. So we don't want it near a power line. We've got to get up there easily, even with pruning like we have here with this modified central leader. You've still got a 15 to 18 foot tree. So think about that. It is taller than it is wide, so you can plant them 12 to 15 feet apart and still be perfectly happy, or you can plant them as far apart as 60 feet. So choosing a location, the perfect place, plenty of sun, good drainage, enough elbow room, and enough height that you don't get crowded. We have been to the nursery. We've selected our pear. We're planting, we're talking pome fruits, so persimmons or apples or pears. Today, I am a huge, huge fan of Asian pears. And in central Alabama, we can grow Shinko, Hosui, and Korean Giant, three really good varieties. And remember, Asian pears are not self-fruitful, so you have to have at least two different varieties for cross-pollination. Um, persimmons, on the other hand, like this guy right here, are self-fruitful. And I like the Japanese persimmons that are sweet. So with these guys, we're going to have a fruit that's ripening, beautiful orange seedless fruit in October, November that's delicious, um, that we don't have to uh, worry about pampering. Now, 
we've been to the nursery, we've selected our plants, but I want to give you a little bit of background. When we get our trees here at the nursery, they come in just like this, a bundle of say five. They've been grown bare root. So that simply means when they're shipped to us, this plant was not grown in a container like I'm growing them. They're grown in the ground, they're dug, and then they're lifted and processed, soaked in water, and then they come to the nursery like this. We then take them, soak them overnight, 24 hours in water, then we transplant them into either a five gallon or a seven gallon container. That allows us to grow this out for another year, get it branched so that it's ready to go in the ground, and then you're one more year away from actually setting fruit. So a second year tree like this Korean giant Asian pear is going to make a lot of root growth, a lot of top growth this year, but it's not going to flower and fruit till next year. So we're only a year away, a little delayed gratification. Um, now, what recipe do you need? What's the key to success? If we're going to come out here to this garden or to this location in our nursery, we've talked about in the previous video how to select the right spot. Now we're talking about what tools do you need? I like a good trench cutting shovel. I love this guy. I have this heavy red clay soil. I know those of you who have that can, can really, really empathize with me. So I've got to cut through that and I simply can't do it with the big wider shovels. I'm much more effective with a nice trenching shovel like this guy. Then you can see this soil that I have dug out of the hole, fairly good amount of clay. And you remember, soil is going to have clay, sand, and loam, but very little organic matter. So I'm heavy on the clay like many of you. So digging this hole, the biggest key is when I take that container plant home with me, I try to set it down into the hole to make sure that I don't dig too deep, but that I dig it wide. So our rule of thumb on planting a containerized apple or pear or persimmon is we're going to dig the hole the exact same depth, but we're going to dig it one and a half to two times as wide. I want to have that lateral root growth going. So you need to have selected for your recipe a good selection of apple, pear, or persimmon. You need to have your good sharp shooter or good trenching shovel like that. Dig your hole, same depth, but one and a half to two times as wide. And then I want you to look at this compost. This is the missing ingredient, the black gold. So composted manure. I like this particular brand, Black Cow, because it's odorless and it's weed free. And when I add that to my soil at a one to one ratio, so however many shovelfuls, of soil have come out, I'm going to put that many shovelfuls of compost onto my soil blend, and then I'm going to take my, my, my tree, put it into the hole, put that mixture in there with it, and then I'm off to the races. So what I'll typically do is get my uh, container set and ready. I'm going to slide that root system out of the pot, and then you can have a really good look at that root system. Isn't that nice? So not root bound by any stretch of the imagination, but there are some roots in there that are circling. And so that's going to happen anytime you've got a containerized plant. So what I typically like to do is just take a good pocket knife or you can do it with your clippers. And I try to not go more than a quarter inch deep. And I just make one cut there. I'll make a quarter turn, make a second cut here. I make another quarter turn and then I'm exactly opposite the first cut that I made. And then I make another quarter turn there and I've clipped it all the way to the bottom. If you get some really tough stuff, you can mess that up, uh, or you can, pardon me, you can cut that up a little bit more, loosen it with your fingers, and then it's off to the races. So then we can take that tree, um, to, pardon me, take that tree, yeah, by the root system, set it down into our hole, double check our depth, make sure that it's not deeper than the uh, original growing depth. The worst mistake we can make is burying it too deep. Then <clears throat> we'll mix our compost in with our soil, and we've got a nice day here. Um, you know, we like to plant our palm fruits. Remember, December, January, February, we've got a perfect, perfect weather day here in late January. We've got some really, really, really good compost here that we can blend in. We'll mix those two together. A little bit more room. So get a nice mixture. My soil, heavy clay, and then 
all composted manure. That makes a great blend. I usually try to just get the tree a little bit higher and maybe a couple of scoops in there. If your heavy clay soil is like mine, it doesn't hurt to scarify the side of the hole, which simply means make a nice cut into the side so that when rainfall occurs and when you water, that water has somewhere to go and then those roots can follow those cuts also. So we got a nice, well-branched Asian pear. Look at these branches. This is just right. I'm going to turn it towards you. So we've got our scaffold limb beginning here, here, and here. That's perfect. I'm hopeful to develop a fourth one over here. And as it continues that growth up, we've got it branching again, and we'll be able to develop another uh, scaffold of limbs up there. So look at the height here, a little bit higher than the soil around it. I can now take my compost blend and rake that in, tamping that in around the soil. Plenty of clay clods. I can make pottery with this stuff out here. But it'll grow a beautiful tree. I much prefer having a reddish colored clay than the blue and kind of yellow clays in Alabama because red clay means it's at least seen oxygen and it can be conditioned. I'll come back. You may have noticed around here in the front foreground, there's pine bark mulch. We are big, big fans of mulch. So once we've gotten this tree planted, we'll water it in. We're going to come back with a two inch layer of good, good compost, excuse me, good, good pine bark mulch or pine straw. In this case, we'll be using pine bark. But at home, use whatever you've got, pine straw or pine bark uh, mulch, either or will do. I think both are attractive, but then they also perform the same function. Remember, your mulches are going to keep the weeds down, keep the moisture in, buffer the temperature when it's very cold outside. They'll keep the soil warmer when it's very hot. They'll keep the soil cooler. So mulch, 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 not deeper than two inches and not right around the collar of the tree but rather all the way around. So I've tamped it in with my fingers. I'll come back. I'll put probably eight, 10 gallons of water, slow and steady, putting that right in. And you can probably tell when you look at that, as I squeeze that, you can see the clay content. You see how that soil holds together. Thankfully, we've got great moisture in the ground. We've had in the last week, five inches of rain, but the forecast for tomorrow, the low around 34, 35, this is perfect planting weather. No freeze in the next two or three days, plenty of soil moisture. We're gonna water it in today. No fertilization for another month. We'll fertilize it at the end of February and start pushing that growth. What I want this tree to do now is go into that warm soil, start making root growth. It's not even thinking about making top growth right now. It can concentrate on doing one thing at a time, just making good root growth. We're getting regular rainfall, thankfully, so I'm not having to pull the hose out here and water it. So we'll get it established. And then as it begins to leaf out and get growing, uh, we'll begin to make sure that we monitor, make sure we're getting one inch of rainfall per week. And if we are, then no worries uh, for sure. So that's our pear, Asian pear planted. You'd use the same technique for an apple, use the same technique for a Japanese persimmon. All those palm fruits like to, to go this route. How long is it gonna live? Well, we mentioned this is a second year tree. Third year is generally when they start making fruit. This tree should produce consistently and very, very well over a 15 to 20 year period. Outside of that, that's pretty much the lifespan of it. If you're still getting fruit, great. We don't fix it if it's not broken. But if you see a decline, that's pretty normal because that's the lifespan of that tree. So annually, we're going to fertilize, we're going to prune, we're going to watch for insects and diseases, and we're going to make sure that we have an irrigation system in here as it begins to fruit. Because remember, Asian pears are fruiting in July, August, into early September. That's when we're hot and dry. We want to be able to supplement that watering. Thank you so much for tuning into our video today. Um, at Petals from the Past, our mission is to approach gardening from an educational standpoint. So to achieve that goal, uh, we have two primary efforts. We plant everything we grow in a garden setting, and that's what we're talking about today. We also host workshops and classes every month. So we would sure love for you to follow us. If you want to keep up with what's going on here, please subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on any of the social media channels. 
And we sure hope to see you here at Pedals from the Past. And please check out our websites, pedalsfromthepast.com. Whole list to tell you everything that we got going on here and then some.